When you fake being someone for so long, you think it's your reality. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to all of us. We play a role at work, we play a role at home, we play a role with our family, we play a role at our friends, and then we think that role is us. Right. And we lose ourselves. And to me, that is the core reason why we're chasing things that are not important to us. We're unhappy despite reaching accolades and we feel dissatisfied. So what should our identity be then? Our identity should start with unlearning everything that we think we know about ourselves. Okay. And How do we unlearn? So the best method of unlearning is this. First, and, and I'm going to get really strategic and tactical because I think that people need to know what to do rather than a concept. The first thing you do is write down everything you currently are chasing in your life. Make a your long goals, list. Your goals, your dreams, your goals, your dreams, accomplishments. Anything that you're currently chasing and pursuing. Okay. Write them down. You yeah. can write down three, you can write down five, you can write down ten depending on how ambitious you are. Second line, ask yourself what is the source of that? Where did you get that idea? Did you get that idea from a TV show you saw? Did you get that idea from your parents? Did you get that idea from your mom and your dad, your sister, your cousin? Did you get that idea because your friend just got proposed to on Instagram? Did you get that idea because your friend just got promoted? Did you get that idea because you just broke up? Right. Or did you get that idea because you just feel it when you do it, that you feel alive? So Ask give, me, yourself give me a specific that. example that you had when you were 15, 18, was like a goal or accomplishment that you were chasing and where it came from. Absolutely, so my, my goal when I was young was to be an investment banker. And when I really asked myself, where did that come from? It came because in my community, small community in London, the most successful person financially was an investment banker. So I believed you had to be an investment banker to be successful. So when I asked myself that question, where does that come from? It comes from society's version of success, not mine. And then the third thing you ask yourself is, well then what is mine? What is coming from inside of me? And if you just do that three-step process, now what you're doing is you're filtering out the noise and you're starting to listen to your voice. The thing is, you've got a voice inside of you, but yeah. it's quiet. It's like, it's like, Jay, like, take note of me, like, Lewis, right, like, right, you right. know, and it's just like trying to get through and the noise of everyone else's opinions is so loud. How so this we, way you filter it. How do we start to find out what we truly want then? Not based on what other people think is success. How do we, how do we listen to ourselves? And if you've been chasing something your whole life, how do you say, well, actually, that's not what I want this is. Yeah, one of the biggest mistakes we make is that we confuse inexperience with being unqualified. So because we've not tried a lot of things, we just naturally believe that we can't be that good at them. So if I've never spoken on a stage, I just think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. Or if I've never played golf, I'd probably think, oh, I'm probably not good at that. And so we start writing off things without even trying them. So the best method I can share with someone is take the next month, take the next four weekends in the month that gives you eight days and get really tactical every single day. That's why you're playing tennis a lot right now. Yeah, I'm playing tennis. tennis. <laughs> <laughs> take the eight days, go join a course, an online course, a workshop, go and shadow a friend, go to a seminar, a conference, go to reading a book, listen to a podcast, go and expose yourself to eight different things in a month. Eight different things. Eight different things in a month. And guess what, in a month, you will have learned what you probably would have learned in eight years because most of us test one new thing a year. Maybe. Maybe, if that, exactly, right? Like some people don't even do that. But if you do eight different things in a month, and this is how you have to see it. If you went to eight different restaurants in a month, you ask yourself after you eat a meal, like I had that burrito or I had that taco, did I like it? Right, the first question you ask yourself is, you, did I like it? You gotta try it first. You gotta try it first, you gotta go to the restaurant. Yeah. There's no point, so you gotta say, did I like it? The second question you ask yourself is, why did I or why did I not like it? Like why is so important? I think too many people just go, I like it or I don't like it. Why didn't I like it? And the third question you have to ask yourself really, really simple is, do I want to do it again? And if you do, that's where you start uncovering. So my point is, inexperience, do not misinterpret inexperience for a lack of qualification. I'm guessing you're doing things in your life right now that you would have written off if you didn't try. I know you've talked about Absolutely. with writing a best-selling book, Absolutely. you've talked about it with Speaking this amazing stage, documentary. Podcast, this documentary, documentary. Things, I mean, yeah. I never believed I could do half the things I'm doing today, and you know that, because we met when I was just creating content on social media. Yeah. And it's like, now when you see things expand, you're like, you don't know until you give it a go, and ask yourself, do I enjoy it? Yes. So I grew up very competitive, mm -hmm. and you talk about competition as one of these, I can't remember if it's like four or five different things, and competition is one of the things that's actually like, um, I wish I had the page right yeah. down here, but you, you talk about competition as like not the highest level of ourself. Yes. Right? 
In my entire life, I was competitive, was driven to beat other people. And in the last seven years, I have shifted so much. I'm still competitive, still want to win, but I'm not like hurt if I lose. I'm not upset, I'm not, it's, that doesn't defeat me emotionally, whereas before it used to be like, this was my identity, winning, I had to win. Now it's like, okay, what did I learn? What did I gain from the experience? Did I have fun? Did I enjoy it? Did I inspire people even if I didn't win in the situation? In, in chapter two, you talk about negativity and the quote you use is, is it, it is impossible to build one's own happiness on the unhappiness of others. Does competition and unhappiness link together in your mind? Like if we need to be competitive to be happy in order if someone else loses, how do we, how do we manage ourselves in this competitive world of winning in sports, of building a bigger business, of these different things, being number one in the New York Times bestseller list? How do we manage that with this world we're in, but also wanting to be happy at the same time? Yeah, what a great question. So. The way I see it is that competition in and of itself is not good or bad. And, and this is like the monk mindset on 99% on of things, that this mug is not good or bad. It could be filled with water or it could be filled with poison. Yes. And so competition, I'll give you an example. Yeah. As monks, our competition is in how much love and respect we show to each other. That's your competition? Like that's what you compete on. Or how, so, how long can we meditate for? No, no, no. So, <laughs> I so can meditate a, longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him. He's scratching his back. He got uh, out. Like he that, moved. You, your meditation <laughs> just got destroyed. Right? <laughs> All the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. They focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates mm -hmm. deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. Right. But, but you compete for showing respect. You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, yes. I, I feel like you have no, this. I didn't you used to do that. Yeah. For the last but seven you did years. It now. Like you course. think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and support each other. Each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that. And, and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use, and this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset. You can use any, yeah thing in a positive way. Now in your second question about uh -huh. what does it mean about business and New York Times bestseller uh -huh. list and being number one, this is how I see it. If while you're writing your book, if while you're recording your podcast, if you're sitting there going, I hope this is gonna be number one. This better be number one. I hope I sell more copies I hope than I sell more copies than this person who's launching at the same time because that's the only way. Well guess what? Now the quality of your output right now has just dropped. Because guess what? You're now living 75% in the future and you're 25% right now. And guess what? This 25% is gonna define that future goal and result. And your happiness. And your happiness. Whether you get the result or not. Totally. Whereas for me, when I was writing my book, and of course I want my book to be a best-selling book. Of course I want my podcast to do well. Of course, we don't do anything for it to be lost. Like no one does that. But what I do know is that when I'm creating, when I'm producing, when I'm writing, that's all I'm doing. See, the truth is that only 2% of the world's population can multitask. Now the crazy thing is when Who are those 2%? When 2% when, when people hear that they think oh, I'm in that oh I'm in that 2%. <laughs> like everyone thinks that that they're in that. But most of us are the 98%. Yeah. And the truth is there is no such thing as multitasking. What it is is fast switching between two tasks. So yes. the quality is just dropping. Cuz you can actually you cannot do two things at one time. You cannot. No one genuinely can do two things at once. I guess you could maybe like pat your head and do this at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you but, can't but, do something productive at the same time. Right. Or creative. And yeah. so what I'm saying is that when you're sitting here going, this needs to be number one, you are reducing that thing's ability to be number one because it now yeah. doesn't have your full focus. Right. So, so that's the difference maker, that you can want to be number one, there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't keep comparing what number one is to someone else's goal too, because everyone's got a different trajectory. Like there are some people that are kind of come in and do really well at one thing and you're gonna do really well at another, and that's why competition has to first be in your space. Mm. Like don't compete in a space that's not yours, right. because now you're just trying to be someone else again and you get a lost identity. in identity. A exactly. Identity. Here are three signs you're struggling with a lack of purpose. Number one, you feel pressure to know what you want to do with your life. Number two, you've lost interest in your own life and feel disconnected. Number three, you don't know what your skills are or you feel you lack them. Hope is not lost. You can get through this. 
Having purpose and meaning in our lives helps guide us through the ups and downs and creates structure in our day-to-day -day life. That's why I've partnered with Calm, the leading app for mental health and wellness. The app has a library with thousands of meditations, songs to help you relax and focus, and sleep stories to help you get a good night's rest. And now you can find The Daily J, a daily series where I'm sharing proven tools and techniques to improve your mindset and mental health in a matter of minutes.